So good evening, everyone. I would like to go ahead with the uh, different aspects of uh, sample size as a theory or as a philosophy. You can say. Let me start by uh, starting with the basic thing that in epidemiology or clinical research, what is the role of sample size? Now, ideally, a study should be done if you are trying to answer a research question, whether it is a descriptive study or it is a hypothesis testing or it is a random. randomized control trial or an intervention research every in every possible research scenario the most ideal condition is that all those persons who are going to be affected by this research that means if you are trying to find out the prevalence of a disease in a particular community then the entire community in which the disease may happen should be studied if we are conducting a, a analytical research in understanding risk factors for a particular disease for example hypertension and the role of stress in hypertension then an ideal study would be to have all the people who suffer from hypertension and we could find out how many of them had a stressful life which could have led to hypertension in them similarly if you are doing an intervention research if there is a new drug to be tried as a therapy for a particular disease then ideally the trial should be done on all those who have the disease this is the utopian or most idealistic situation but you all understand that this is impossible to achieve we cannot conduct a study on an entire population the target population we cannot conduct a study on all patients of a particular disease or we cannot do that intervention on everybody as a trial so given that all these scenarios are so difficult to achieve what is it that we can do best second best rather is to do the study on a subset of people and on the basis of that subset of people we draw the inferences and try to believe that the inferences drawn on that small sub sample will be applicable and valid for the entire representative population from which we have drawn the sub sample let me give you an analogy uh, most of you are very young if i understand because i can't see your faces i don't know how old or young you are but when we were kids if we had to buy rice from the market rice was not sold in 1 kg packs or 5 kg packs or like that so you have to buy uh, rice in sacks and the sacks may be weighing 25 kg or 40 kg or 100 kg so when you go uh, in those times when we went to buy rice how you know that a sack containing 100 kg of rice is uniformly good i mean the sack can have partly good quality of rice if you open the mouth of the rice sack and you uh, if you see that okay the mouth is open so only the grains which are lying on the top of the sack on the superficial part of the sack you can see that so an unscrupulous businessman will put the best quality of rice in first 2 3 inches of the layer and the rest can be put as a poor quality rice so in order to judge that the quality of rice in the sack is uniformly good one way is to turn the sack upside down and uh, spill all the grains on the floor and then you see the whole thing which obviously the businessman or the trader will not allow so what do you do or what they used to do they used to have a device a contraption like a like a what you say a a, a kind of a knife with a groove in it and you just saw that a knife into the sack and when you withdraw it it will contain some grains in it right now you look at that grains and that you can do in set 10 different parts of the sack at the bottom at the top at the middle at the side and everywhere so that means maybe if it is a 100 kg rice sack by taking 10 different samples suppose every time you are able to do 20 grams of the rice so you have got 200 grams of the rice being taken out from 10 different samples from 10 different part of the sacks and then you judge that whether in all those parts the quality of the rice was uniform it was of the same quality as promised or as it was seen in the superficial part of the sack and then you make a judgment whether you are going to buy the rice or not or that particular sack you are interested in taking or not so exactly this is what happens in our quantitative epidemiological research that the population most of the time which we are targeting to understand the epidemiology of a disease or anything about is larger than that sack and it's not possible to uh, look at every grain so you need to draw samples from different parts of that population and this drawn part is known as the sample so it is less than an ideal situation so how good is your understanding of the quality of rice depends on how efficiently and smartly you draw those samples 
So the same thing happens here. That from the target population, how efficiently, smartly, and effectively you drew your sample is going to decide that the inferences drawn on the research conducted on that sample is going to be applicable or representative of the entire population on which the inferences are to be drawn, right? So this is the premise of calculating a sample size. And it not only depends on the fact how big is your sample size, how many people you should include in your study of that particular category, but also what are the possible sources of error that creep into your research because it's sample-based. So I try to understand that, that how, uh, how, uh, erroneous your study or your results can become will depend on certain variability. Now here I'm introducing a term variability and today morning only probably I saw an email where Asis has talked about variable and he said that he's going to introduce the term variable at some point of time somewhere but we need to understand it here that all parameters that we measure in a research are concerning the measurement of certain biological phenomenon or social phenomenon or natural phenomenon occurring in our body. Right. And because every individual has a different value for one particular characteristic, and that value varies from person to person, and maybe it varies within the same person at different points of time, and you cannot predict or you cannot pinpoint that variability to 100% accuracy. Let me elaborate with an example. What is a variable? A variable is your gender, whether you are male or female is a variable. Why do we call it a variable? That suppose there is a crowd which has mixed population, like it has males, it has females. And the door is closed and you are standing outside that door and you have Shelja sitting with you. And you are asking Shelja that the next person who will walk out of the room after opening the door is going to be a male or female. Now Shelja may give an answer that the person going to walk out may be a male. It so happens, she does not know and you don't know that who is going to walk out next. So it may be right that the person turns out to be male or it may be wrong and the person who actually walks out is a female. That means there is an uncertainty that who's the person who's going to walk out is going to be a male or a female. Then you assign a quantitative value to that probability, that possibility of whether a male will walk out or a female is walk, will walk out. And that probability can vary anything between 0% and 100%. But the most likely probability is 50%. Why? Because you don't know. And there are only two possible answers, either male or female. So that way the probability is 50%. But if the options were four, say, if I add another dimension to it, male and female, and whether wearing a specs or not wearing a specs. So now there are four possible combinations, male wearing a specs, male not wearing a specs, female wearing a specs, female not wearing a specs. So the person who is walking out is going to be any one of the four possible combinations. And that makes it 25%. You add a third dimension, a third variable, and the probability will come down to 12.5% of a particular answer. This is what we understand as a variability in statistics. So when you are going to draw a sample from a population and want to study certain characteristics, maybe their sex or it may be their spec specs wearing habit, their blood pressure, their blood sugar level, they're being suffering from a particular disease or not suffering from a particular disease, whether they are alcoholics or not alcoholics, whether they smoke, they don't smoke. You keep on adding every dimension, which has one more than one probability as an answer. If there's only one probability of the answer, it's not a variable, it's a constant. The person who's going to walk out from that room is going to be a human being only. It's not a goat, it's not an elephant, it's not a tiger. It's a constant. That human being will walk out of the room, there's no variability in that because no other species have been put into the room. So there's no variability, so there's no questioning of any sample or any uncertainty in probability. So something that is 100% or only one possible dimension, then it is not a variable. And if it's not a variable, we are not bothered about that in a sample size or, or in the sample size guide. So it's very important to understand this variability as a concept when you are doing a sample-based research, right? This is the first thing I wanted you to understand. And the moment you introduce this concept of variability, the variability introduces the concept of uncertainty. And when it is a matter of uncertainty, you always try to be as certain as possible within that uncertainty frame. Am I going to pass the exam? I don't know. 
That is the first answer. But the subsequent answer is that, yes, I have done good. I think out of 20 questions, I have answered 17, 18 correctly. And if I have answered 18 correctly, I think, and even if there are 15 correct, I'm going to pass. So that uncertainty, you are trying to assign a measurement to it. And the reality may be when the results come out, you get only 50%. You passed. On that dichotomous variability, you, you said you were going to pass, you passed. So it was a 100% correct answer. But you said you answered 18 correctly, so you should have this out of 20, you should have scored 90% marks. And you thought maybe two were wrong, you should have scored 16, uh, sorry, 16, yeah, that means you should have scored 80% mark. But your result came to be 50%. That means your probable estimate was gone wrong and what you actually got in paper was 50%, whereas you were expecting 80%. So there was an error in your judgment by a value of 30%. Now, could you classify that why there was a 30% error? How I should have assessed myself better that if I said I'm going to get 80%, my results should also come out as 80%. That depends on your ability to correctly and accurately assess a situation. Let's come back to epidemiology. When you are doing a research based on sample, the sample by default carries a variability with it. That out of your target population of 10,000, you are going to select a sample of 300 people. And those 300 people, when you are doing the measurement on those people, will give you a certain value of the parameter or the variable that you are going to study. That variable will have different values in the remaining 9,700 people who are lying in the population. And so we, when you again do a sample of 300 fresh people, a different set of people, you are going to get a different value of the variable. But your limitation is that you cannot at a time take more than 300 people out of that 10,000. So you have to work in that limitation and you have to ensure that with that given 300 people, how accurately I can predict the value of a particular variable in that entire population. This is where your statistical mastermind or your ability to conduct a statistically valid research will rest on. And that is why there is so much to know or so much to understand about getting the right sample size, getting the right sampling technique and getting the right sample in terms of measurements that you are going to do. Right. So now if you proceed systematically to the more mathematical side of it, those uncertainties that we talked about are known as possible errors. And these errors uh, if I remember correctly, you had a uh, you had a class by Shelja on hypothesis testing, right? So there you must have heard of a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. And in that hypothesis testing, you might have come across two terms. One is called type one error, and the other is called type two error, right? Or alpha error and beta error, like that. So these. Uh, these uncertainties, which are based on your sample study, are basically, we are calling them as errors. And we are likely to make two types of errors. One is alpha error or type 1 error, and the other is known as the type 2 error. Okay, your objective is to minimize both the errors. As less error you make in your inferences, the more accurate extrapolation of your results will be on the larger population for which you are trying to understand with different parameters of, right? So what is the ideal situation? Ideal situation is type one error should be 0% and type two error should also be 0%, but that is again hypothetical. In a sample-based study involving variables, you can never have a 0% type one error and 0% type two error. So now you start compromising. How much error is permissible? Again, let's take another example. In medical profession, it is said that a doctor should be as good as that, that using the best knowledge, he should be able to cure every patient where there is a cure available. And for that, if somebody says in a medical profession, a student must score 100% marks in every subject, then only we will consider that he is a good doctor. That means he knows his entire medical sciences. And unless he knows that, how can he be a good doctor? Or you can extend that logic even to engineering or law or anything. But 
because life and death are the most important parameters i am taking this that he should be 100% efficient and he can be 100% efficient only if he has 100% knowledge so all professional examinations should have a rider that unless you score 100% marks you are not going to get an mbbs degree that is the hypothetical situation so we start compromising but up to what level of knowledge assessed quantitatively using the tools available we can consider a person to be good enough to practice medicine and if you start compromising gradually we decided to fix the margin at 50% which is of course very arbitrary but we said that 50% is the margin if you score 50% or above we will consider you as good enough to practice medicine and if you score 49.999% you are not good enough to practice medicine that objective criteria need not necessarily translate into the efficiency of that person as a doctor that's also some kind of an uh, some kind of a compromise you are making so the same thing happens here that if 0% type 1 error is not possible should we stop at 1% should we stop at 5% should we stop at 50% and that call of judgment is not taken by the statistician that call of judgment is taken by you as the researcher that how much error is acceptable in the research that i am going to do now that the quantity of research has become quite substantial thousands of people are simultaneously doing research in thousands of places so we have to arrive at a consensus and that consensus is that our type 1 error should be not more than 5% now i won't go into the detail of describing type 1 error because i believe that has been covered or you already know that because that is the premise on which sample size is calculated and the second error which is known as the beta error or type 2 error is more difficult to control to in order to achieve 5% type 2 error beta error or to achieve 1% beta error the study will become prohibitively large and complicated so we started compromising and we compromised and came to a consensus that the allowed type 2 error for a research to be conducted as valid was fixed at 20% now these two numbers 5% and 20% are not sacrosanct these are arbitrary values just like the 50% passing marks in mbbs is an agreed upon arbitrary value if university thinks that we can give five grace marks to a student then if he scores 45 then also is considered as passed so this is all these things are even in statistics which is a very mathematical subject these assignments of numbers are to a large extent arbitrary so to be happy with our research we put these cut off marks as uh, cut off points as 5% type 1 error and 20% type 2 error the entire exercise of calculating sample size is juggling between these two parameters how do i how do i make the best combination of type 1 error and type 2 error that i do not allow it to exceed 5% in the first case and 20% in the second case and the inverse of type 2 error you already know is power of study that is if the type 2 error is 20% then power of the study is 80% right so in the end you want to when you present your research to the world you want to say look my type 1 error is not more than 5% but if you say my type 1 error is not even 1% people will sit up and look oh here is a study which is better than the norms or better than the standard it is it is setting a new benchmark that is it has reduced its error to 1% and power of the study also standard is 80% but you are saying no i am able to achieve 90% power better definitely better but at what cost is it that we are making too much efforts in doing one research where 80% is acceptable i am going to 90% i am going to 95% that's really not needed so these are arbitrarily set guidelines okay the next important part is that the calculation of the sample size involving these two parameters become a little more complicated due to certain other factors which creep in which are not as significantly life altering as type 1 and type 2 error but there are and those factors vary from design of the study so if you are going to do a descriptive study if you want to know the magnitude of a disease then if you are going to do, find out the prevalence of a disease 
then you need a different method to calculate that sample size. So we developed a formula, which is the most popularly, popularly known formula among the researchers that if you are doing a prevalence study, then you calculate the sample size uh, using a formula which is commonly known as 4PQ by L square. And you have to know what is P, what is Q, what is L, and where does that... And one thing here also important is that in prevalence study, only type 1 error is taken into consideration type 2 error does not feature in descriptive study where you are trying to quantify a number of any particular event and describe it as a, percent, as a percentage or as a proportion. So there only the type 1 error is taken into consideration. And this 4 pq by L squared, the formula which we commonly use, some of you must already be knowing, but you should also know that this is not actually 4. This is Z alpha squared. And the Z alpha value, Z here is the Z score in the Z table, and alpha is type 1 error. So the Z score for a defined value of alpha, which we put it as 5%, will be 1.96. And if you square 1.96, it's approximately 4. So to be more accurate, you need to actually do 1.96 square and not write it as 4. Just as an example, I told you that this is, in this formula, this four is actually taking care of the type one error. Now, if the study becomes a little more complex in design, that means if you are doing an analytical research, that is either you are doing a case control study or you are doing a cohort study, then your one uniform homogeneous sample of the population is now at least divided into two. One, that group, which is called case. And if you know what is the case control study, case here means the person having a disease and the other group is controlled, the person not having the disease. So your entire universe is now divided into two groups, one which has the disease, that is your cases, and the other which does not have the disease. So now in prevalence study, you had one universe. Either the person had the disease or did not have the disease, study uh, uh, over. But in the other one, case control study, those who have the disease is one group, those who do not have the disease is another group, and you are going one step further to find out those who have the disease, did they have the risk factor for which we are doing the study, a case control study, and whether the control group had the risk factor or did not have the risk factor. So when two parameters got involved here, we have to take into consideration both of these parameters in our sample size calculation. So when you look at the formula for calculating, uh, which you might have seen in the video uh, earlier that is said, the formula becomes slightly complicated, okay? And the formula used in case control study design cannot be used for calculating uh, the sample size in prevalence study and vice versa. There's another analytical research that is your cohort study. Now the inferences drawn from cohort study and case control study are very similar. We know the purpose of both these studies are to find out whether the particular factor is a risk factor for a disease or not. Mostly the case control and cohort studies are done for those purposes. Assessing the risk or the risk ratio or odds ratio relative risk, by different terms we know that. So here, not only the outcome, but the exposure also becomes important. That's why my formula becomes a little more complicated. And when the third type of study, that is an intervention research we do, the most common of which or most valuable of which is the randomized control trial, there are certain other parameters put into it. And because more parameters are included, now the sample size calculation takes a different formula and so that we calculate the exact value of the sample size that is required. Okay, so this is one part that whether you are doing a descriptive study or whether you are doing an analytical study or you are doing an intervention research is going to determine that how you are going to calculate your sample size. Okay, besides that, there are two other groups of studies which require sample size, rather three other groups of studies which require sample size calculation. One is de de detecting the efficacy or efficiency of a screening tool or a diagnostic tool. That means these researches were to understand risk factor and interventions. There's another research to find out whether we are able to diagnose the disease correctly in a clinical setting or whether we are able to identify suffering people from a particular disease in a community setting. Okay, and whether the tool are in our hand to do that, whether it is an X-ray or whether it is a blood test or whether it is a questionnaire, which is ab whose ability to detect the disease we try to identify, you are trying to judge. For that also, to test the ability of that particular tool, you need to conduct a study 
And that study also has to be based on a sample. So the sample size calculation for screening tools and diagnostic tools also based on formula. And again, this formula is going to be different from the formula which is used for a similar case control study design. Because there also you have two group of people who have the disease, who do not have the disease, and you have a test which may detect the disease, which may not be able to detect the disease. So it will have a different sample uh, formula. Okay. And the last scenario is that all studies are not confined to our environmental factors. By environmental, I mean it's social factors, it's our habits, it's our diet, our environment, which are affecting our, uh, our health and causing disease. Okay, that scenario is a genetic component that we know that our disease status is influenced by the genetic makeup of our body. So in order to include the genetic influences in the outcome, we have to calculate sample size for genetic studies. And for that also, the sample size calculation formulas are different. So the take home message from this is that it is the nature of the study, the research question, and the methodology you are going to use is going to decide how are you going to calculate your sample size. We cannot mix up one study design sample size formula to be used for calculating sample size for a different type of study design. That will be a very important error we will be making if we do that. I hope that's clear. Then another important thing I want you to understand is, yes, the next thing I want to harp upon in a few minutes is about the sampling methods. Most of us face this challenge of how to ensure that the sample is random. Because every time we use the word random sample, the random has a very significant connotation in the entire process. So by now you must be knowing that a random sample or a random, uh, if a random sample has to be random, what does this random mean? Theoretically, a random sample means that out of the population from which we are, I'm going to draw my sample, each and every subject in that population has equal probability or equal opportunity of being selected or being included in my research. That is assured by randomness of my sample. Okay, so we say we are going to conduct a random sample based study. Now, this is a very tricky component. How do you ensure that your sample is random? There are more challenges in ensuring random sample than in designing anything else in a research design. This is my experience from uh, working in the field of epidemiology and statistics for, uh, for whatever years I have been doing that. And every time I find that majority of this uh, set of researchers come bargaining with the statistician with two things. Can we reduce the sample size? It's a bargain. Can we, uh, can we tweak certain things so that what you are asking is strictly as a random, if I tweak that little bit, will that affect my study? And they bargain that somehow do something that I use a smaller sample size than what you have calculated and do something that, see, you cannot get the random, so please allow us to do the study even if we cannot do the random sample. So it is like a patient coming and bargaining with you as a doctor that you are going to prescribe me five medicines to cure me. Can we not reduce it to two? A tuberculosis patient, if he comes and says that so many pips to, uh, pills to pop in a day, this is just humanly impossible. I want to bargain, give me 50% of the pills and assure that I will get cured. Now, as a doctor, you probably can never do that. And the same is the dilemma of the statistician. That the way scientists or researchers pressurize the statistician, intimidate him into, uh, into accepting the bargain and saying that, okay, do it on a smaller sample or do it on a non-random sample, is same as putting the life of the patient at risk because the patient is bargaining for it. Okay, so that's why ensuring randomness is very important. And that randomness assurance actually has a further complication. We say simple random sample. When we say simple random sample, what does it mean? It means that the entire population cannot be stratified into subgroups. And even if it is a one lakh population and you are going to draw a sample of 2000, you have to ensure that every one of that one lakh people has equal opportunity of being included in your sample at 2000. You can visualize how among us the problem may be or how difficult it may be to achieve, right? In different settings. I won't go into that detail because of the paucity of time. 
So what I will do is, I'll tell you that we need to be as random as possible. If we cannot achieve simple random sampling, let us go for stratified random sampling. Let us go for systematic random sampling, or let us go for population proportionate sampling, or you can even go for cluster random sampling. These are basically uh, small, small gifts given to compromise with the simple random sampling, which is the most correct and most appropriate technique of sampling. Okay, but you cannot go out of this domain of the listed methods of random sampling, that is simple random or systematic random or stratified random or population proportionate or cluster random. Now, random sampling is what we want, but at the same time, if random sampling is not doable, then all hopes are not lost. You can still conduct research with non-random sample, but remember and beware that if you are conducting a research using a non-random sample, then do not apply inferential statistics, which is valid only when your sample is random. So don't collect a sample in a non-random manner and expect to apply a t-test there, expect to apply a linear regression there, which is based on the principle of random sampling, right? So you do a non-random sample and be honest about it and tell the world that your sample is not random, Therefore, in spite of a large sample size, I'm not going to apply any test of significance. That is the highest level of statistical honesty, if, you can, if I can use that term. And there are several methods of non-random sampling. To list a few again, it can be convenience sample, it can be judgmental sample, it can be quota sampling, it can be snowball sample, or it can be a lot quality assurance technique of sampling, whatever. These are the non-random sampling techniques. Okay. So this is what I wanted to give you as a background knowledge when you embark on calculating your sample size, right? The life of the statistician 20, 30, or 40 years ago was very tough. He only had basic calculating devices at his disposal, and he had to calculate sample size by putting in numbers in the complex formulae and then calculating the sample size. In your times, the work has become easier, like in all other fields. For example, for a clinician, without a battery of laboratory and radiological investigations, diagnosis was based on clinical acumen. But today, the battery of investigations available, I will say not battery, it's a plethora of investigations available are so, so used that your clinical acumen occupies a minuscule percentage of the entire diagnosis process. We rely so much on the laboratories and the radiological tools than our clinical acumen. And as a result, just like Darwin's evolution theory, the clinical acumen is gradually declining among the clinicians and it is taken over by the technology, whether it is laboratory based or it is radiology based or it is ultrasound based or whatever technology you talk about. So the medical uh, sciences, which in, when we were students was told that diagnosis is an art. Now we cannot anymore say that diagnosis is an art. Now diagnosis is a science. The art has taken a backseat. So the same thing happens here, that here art, uh, it is more of a science and it has become easier. Easier in the sense that you need not sit down with your uh, 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 pen and paper, write down the formula and start putting in the values into that to calculate the sample size. The life has been made easier by ready to use plug-in methods of calculating the sample size. So you are freed from the burden of remembering, mugging up, or always carrying a handbook of sample size formulae for calculating your sample sizes. All you need are the software in your laptop, which or in your computer, or now even on your mobile phone, that in any case you are carrying. So there's no more an extra burden on you for calculating the sample size. Life has become that much more easier for you. Okay, I, I have a question here. Um, the query is regarding statistical analysis in a convenient sample study. I would like to ask it through an example. In COVID times, we started a study where we took a convenient sample of patients coming to our hospital during a two month period. So do we apply test of significance or not in this study? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. What I said was that convenience sample means you have not 
adhere to random sum. So all the tests of significance which have a pre-criteria or a precondition that these tests are applicable only on randomly selected sample, you're not supposed to apply those tests of significance. Okay, but if it is a convenient sample or if it is a non-random sample, then you can apply the tests which are applicable. For example, some of them are known as the non-parametric test. Now, non-parametric tests have two types of scenario. One is a smaller sample size, very small sample size, where the principle of normalcy cannot be upheld, then you apply a, a, a non-parametric test. Sometimes in convenient sample also, depending on, uh, okay, uh, just to add, I'll say that statistical analysis is of two types, exploratory statistical analysis and inferential statistical analysis. First, you carry out exploratory data analysis of the data that you have collected after convenient sample and see whether each variable what is the distribution of the variable? Whether it is normally distributed, it is not normally distributed. If it is not normally distributed, then what kind of distribution is follows? There are about 70 different types of distributions. In our medical sciences, most commonly we use three or four distributions. At most advanced statisticians may use 10 distributions, not more than that. So what are those distributions? You know, chi-square is a distribution. Okay, exponential is a distribution. Log uh, exponential or logarithmic is a distribution. Poisson is a distribution. Poisson probability, Poisson uh, uh, when we calculate. So, and there is an alpha distribution and a beta distribution like that. There are several distributions. So your exploratory data analysis will tell you what type of distribution is there and that will determine which test of significance you can apply. I hope Rashmi, I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Okay. I got the answer, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, yeah. So going ahead, I was uh, talking to you about calculation of sample size using software. Now, fortunately, we have a large number of uh, software available. Some of them are free and some of them are priced and it does not depend on that. What matters is that you're, uh, how familiar or how comfortable with you are using those software. Okay, so let me show you just two examples of using two different um, sample size calculations uh, using two different uh, tools of sample size calculation. Right. So uh, I, I'm sure earlier you must have been told about uh, two software which we recommended for use. And one of them is called power and sample size calculations. Okay, so I select this power and sample size app. And when I open, so this is how you launch the program. If it is installed in your computer, then you just double click on that and this icon will appear. And then if we click on continue, you will get the other screen, which will open something like this, right? Okay, now the next thing you have to do is that what is the purpose you are going to do? So in order to use this particular software, what do you want to know? It's asking you a question, what do you want to know? And if you click on the drop down menu, it shows sample size, power, or detectable alternative. So I want to calculate sample size. So I choose sample size. Then it automatically takes me to the next uh, level where it says, what is the design of your research? Or to explain it further, it says, how is the alternative hypothesis expressed? And it gives you two options. Now, these two options are being given as two survival times and hazard ratio. The reason is that here at the top, we selected the module of calculating sample size for survival analysis. We didn't want to do that. If we want to do it in a research design where we are going to calculate a t-test statistic, we will use the t-test one. If you want applying a regression analysis, you are going to choose the regression one. The first one is for linear regression. The second one is uh, that are analyzed by linear regression with two treatment, and this is with one treatment. And this is dichotomous. Dichotomous means when we are using a two by two table. And this is when our research is based on mantle hansel statistics. So depending on the nature of analysis that you are going to do, you are going to choose. Now in this exercise, we decided to take the root of a case control study design. I'll give you an example later. And case control study design, where we have a two by two uh, analysis table, when we are calculating odds ratio, we call it a dichotomous design. In the dichotomous design, 
we have again what do you want to know sample size power or detectable alternative we want to know the sample size now it is asking us whether the case control design is matched or independent so if we choose that this is an independent design and not a paired design and it's asking you that if it's a case control whether it is case control study or prospective study so on the front face of it at the interface it's it's giving you an algorithm to simultaneously design your study or uh, design your uh, study for case control or cohort because the other one it says prospective so the same template can be used either for calculating sample size for a cohort study design or a case control study design so once we select case control it asks us how is the alternative hypothesis expressed that means are you calculating odds ratio or you are calculating two proportions so suppose we are calculating an odds ratio and then it asks that with this odds ratio which type of test of significance you are going to use uncorrected chi square or fisher's exact now you have to know where to apply fisher's exact and we have to apply uncorrected chi square the moment we say that it puts on the five parameters of input alpha that is alpha error power that is inverse of or uh, inverse of beta error p0 is the prevalence of that particular condition in the or the risk factor in that group m now what are these symbols it's easy to know any symbol if you don't understand the hand sign if you click on that it will open a help window and this help window will tell you each parameter what does it mean so alpha means type 1 error power means uh, like as i told you already that it is inverse of the uh, beta error p0 is the prevalence or probability of exposure to the risk factor in the control group p1 is not needed though they have explained what is m m is the ratio of control to experimental subject that means in a case control study we always decide whether we are going to have a 1 is to 1 ratio or 1 is to 2 ratio or 1 is to 3 ratio like that so in m we have to put that ratio and the other term is this is the phi term and this means odds ratio of exposure in cases relative to control so another important thing in this kind of research is that our research is based on a priori hypothesis a priori hypothesis means before embarking on the research whatever known data was there you are going to make use of that and using that a priori knowledge you are adding your own research to it and you are generating post hoc knowledge or new knowledge and that new knowledge will become a priori knowledge for the subsequent researchers to do that okay so keeping that in mind here we have to know what is the hypothesized odds ratio or previously known odds ratio for that same analysis you have to put it here once you fill up all these data you click on calculate and it will give you the sample size okay so quickly let's look at a research uh, a study which amir has shared as an exercise for this particular work uh, you must be having it with you it says the case control study is being planned to find out the association between severe covid 19 and type 2 diabetes mellitus a previous study has shown that among those with diabetes 59 developed severe compared to 256 that is 17% of non the uh, t2dm patients got it and the resulting in an odds ratio of 3.53 so my a priori odds ratio in this particular case is given as 3.53 i put it there the m is my ratio and i most commonly we take the ratio of 1 is to 1 that is equal number of cases and control by default the type 1 error we are putting at 0.05 and power of the study if we take type 2 error as 20% power of the study we will take 80% expressed in absolute numbers always do not write 80 here do not write 5 here you have to convert into absolute values that is 0.05% 0.05 as 5% is to be written as 0.05 and 80% is to be written as 0.8 and it's also asking what is the exposure risk factor in the control group so here it is 17.6% so i will put it as 0.176 so now all uh, all questions are answered and then i say calculate so when you calculate it at the top it's giving you a sample size value which is 50 the next important question is how to express this sample size and to make life easier for you it has given you the entire detail here 
it says we are planning a study of independent cases and controls with one control per case prior data indicate that the probability of exposure among controls is 0.176 that is 17.6 percent if the true odds ratio for disease in exposed subjects relative to unexposed subjects is 3.53 we will need to study 50 case patients and 50 control patients to be able to reject the null hypothesis that this odds ratio equals one with probability or power of 80 percent and the type 1 error probability associated with this test uh, with the test of this null hypothesis is 0 0.05 so many times the pg students and come and say hey, you have calculated the sample size now tell us how to write it in the protocol so that makes life easier you can copy it to the log so you say copy to log and then you go to log and in log it's giving you everything which for some which uh, which uh, software we used what was the version how to cite that in your references list how to cite that what is the type of study what did you want to know what test you are going to apply using this data and this entire narrative and this you can directly go to the file uh, sorry you can print it the log can be printed so you go to print log and it will give you a printout or you save log to a file you can save it for your reference subsequently so this is as easy to use to calculate sample size and this can be used in all these conditions when you are doing a survival analysis, when you are using quantitative data, a t-test applying, or you are doing regression or a proportion analysis data that is a case control design or a mantle high cell design, right? This is about the power and sample size program. It is free. It can be downloaded. It can be installed on most of the basic computers, right? The other a very relevant software or very useful software is called G-Power. So if you take G-Power, G-Power has something like this. And this is more organized than your PNS. But obviously, if it is more organized, it gives more options. So it's a little complicated to use. But it gives you so many options. Which type of test you are going to use? If it says T-test or exact or F-test or chi-square test or Z-test. And in what scenario? The scenarios are so many. It can be correlation, it can be linear regression, bivariate regression or multivariate regression. It can be means, comparison of means in different scenarios, between two dependent means, between two independent means, difference from a constant. Will, are, when you have non-parametric test, when your data is not normally distributed, you use these non-parametric tests. So even for those, you can calculate the sample size here. And the example given are Wilcoxon sign rank test for match pairs for one sample and for two groups. And you can go for a generic test also, right? And then it also asks you what type of power analysis you want to do. You want to calculate the sample size. You want to, you can calculate of all the five parameters that is alpha, beta, power, uh, sorry, alpha, beta, and sample size. Of the three, Two, you have to provide the third, it will calculate by defect. And yes, it adds another dimension that is effect size. So out of four possible dimensions, you feed three and it will give you the fourth value. Any three you feed the fourth value, it will give you. So that is the beauty of this particular program. And that is why it is more advanced than the other one, right? So these are the input parameters. So as I'm already running out of time, it's an hour. So either you can do it as an exercise or quickly, if we look at the second exercise that Amir has provided, we are looking at a research question, whether there's a difference in efficacy of ACE2 antagonist and ACE inhibitor. Now it's a quantitative variable. And what we are using here is a quantitative data. Drug treatment group, all parameters were assumed as follows. Mean change of systolic uh, STBP, what is that? Uh, sitting diastolic blood pressure, sorry. In new drug treatment group, 18 millimeter of mercury. Mean change in the standard treatment group is 14. So the difference between the two groups is four. And the delta zero is three millimeter and S standard deviation of the sample is it. All, all these parameters are given along with alpha beta. All you need to do here is to first decide whether you are going for a one tail study or a two tail design you calculate the effect size. If you do not know the effect size, you can determine the effect size. It will give you an option to calculate the effect size. And here effect size can be calculated by giving different parameter values and it will calculate the effect size for you. Okay.
Yeah, let's keep it at that only. And if it is a t test, and we are going to use it for independent means. So most here it is a comparison between two independent means. So you put up the mean one, mean two, the ST of group one and ST of group two. You include these parameters, and if you calculate, it will give you the effect size by default. So here, if I randomly put the values, uh, so it is saying 18 and 14 are the two means, and the two standard deviations given here are uh, delta zero is uh, delta is four, and suppose if I group the other one as eight, and so it will calculate the effect size. Now you transfer the effect size to this window, and you can close this. And then alpha error is 0 0.05, beta error or power it's giving us 0.95, which is too high. We will reduce it to 80%. Allocation ratio one is to one, we will keep and we will say calculate. And in calculation, it's telling you the total sample size required is 64. The sample size in group one is 32, sample size in group two is also 32. Okay. And this also, and this also has another very important aspect to do is you can draw a graph, you know, you draw a plot, but by to see a sliding scale with different power. If you change the power, how the sample size will vary from having a minimum power of 60% to a power of 95%, the sample size will go up from something around 32 to 110. So it gives you this beautiful graph to make you understand that at what power, what is the exact required sample size with the given calculations. Okay, it can be given in a tabular form also. So that is the added advantage of this particular design. So you calculated the sample size. The only problem is it does not give you the narrative as you found in the power and sample size calculation. Here you have to write the narrative on your own. Got it? Okay, so now since it's time up, I'll stop here. These are the two uh, uh, two sample sizes that I wanted to, uh, the methods of calculating the sample size that I uh, wanted to show you. So I'll stop there because these were the two area. I wanted to give you a background of sample size calculation and demonstrate these two methods of calculating sample size or these two software. So now I'm handing it back to Ashish. Let Ashish take over and decide what will be the next course of action. Thank you. Sir, um, let me just uh, emphasize on what uh, Professor Sharma has just said. Most of us, uh, except a few of us, most of us would be using practically two kinds of calculations to conduct a sample size, a sample size estimation. We will either be doing a t-test in which we will be comparing the mean in one group with the mean in another group and try to find out if there is a difference between the two groups. The other calculation that we will be using is to try and see if one proportion in one group is different from another, from the proportion of the same parameter in another group. So largely speaking, both these calculations we have tried to demonstrate here. We will also give you as exercises the same kind of calculations, either trying to compare two means or trying to compare two proportions on two groups. Most of the sample size calculation will be based on these two tests. And these two tests will be enough for largely most of the designs that we will be throughout our careers, except a very few of us who might be entering into complicated designs, which will be different. But for largely most of your studies, these two sample size calculations should be more than sufficient. Hi, uh, Dr. Sharma. I, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I have, I have, a, I'm Nishad. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Yes, so, please go ahead. One uh, about uh, non-random sampling. Uh, you mentioned about the difference in uh, statistical testing. And in the lecture that was shared, you also mentioned about uh, uh, considering a design effect uh, when we use cluster sampling or some other form of sampling. Yeah. But do these apply to uh, randomized control trials? I mean, are you only talking about observational studies? 
or uh, do these considerations apply to randomized control trials also because most uh, even uh, large multi centric randomized control trials we uh, enroll at least in neonatology we enroll neonates based on uh, consecutive admissions uh, not uh, true random sampling may because partly maybe patient availability and all that yeah so uh if you are going to use a, a non random sampling technique then the application of the statistical test of significance becomes compromised do you get my point so, yes. so the issue is i do that, yeah yeah but, so, but uh, randomization i mean if it's a large enough sample size and if uh, they are randomized we are only concerned if the groups are different uh, right uh, in other i mean if the groups are similar in all respects other than the intervention uh, specifically for randomized control trials so do we still have to worry that it was a non random sample yes in uh, in all situations we have to ensure that the sample is randomized say if you are talking about randomized control trial then by default randomization is an essential component of your study design if you cannot randomize uh, that group then probably your your your, uh, your research is not an rct now here we have an option that if we cannot do a direct randomization like if you cannot randomize each individual patient into a group you go for group randomization or cluster randomization suppose there is a mega study involving say five villages or six villages now you say that i am not going to randomize each individual child in the community to a particular group right so i will cluster randomize in the sense that out of six randomly three villages are allocated to the intervention arm and the three villages remaining three villages are allocated to the uh, to the control arm but individual is not randomized but a block is randomized altogether that is permissible okay so in randomization whether you use simple randomization or cluster or block randomization that is fine but if your sample is not randomly selected then the rct does not hold good anymore okay thank you sir uh, and one other thing uh in the lecture that was shared again you were talking about uh, one tailed t test in the context of uh, let's say uh, some situations like uh, vasectomy and fertility rate after that uh, but in practice uh, the only occasions where we seem to see it is something like non inferiority trials in 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 regular uh, practice do we use one tailed uh, tests any in any other situation or is it always uh, two tail testing hypothesis testing other than in randomized control trial in other scenarios also it is important for example if you are doing an analytical research in the analytical research situation you are hypothesizing that a particular factor is a risk factor for a disease you don't know anything there is no prior knowledge that may not be a risk factor that may be actually a protective factor so if you do a one tail test you are going with a premise that it's going to be a risk factor that means i'm going to get odds ratio greater than 1 what if the odds ratio turns out to be less than 1 if the odds ratio along with its 95% confidence interval values are below 1 then it is actually not a risk factor but a protective factor so unless you are very sure that it's a risk factor it can be a protective factor also so you have to go for a two tail design there or if you are sure that yes it is a risk factor i am going to quantify then you can stick to one tail design par and sample size is a software which gives you exactly what you need to write in your protocols and you just need to change a few words here and there and you can just copy the paragraph and put it there in your sample size estimation in your methodology and it works pretty decently and pretty well so if you have a little bit of common sense you just change one or two words there and uh, substitute a few parameters and you will be uh, in in good in good uh, way any more questions we have here okay bhai i ask a question uh, to the um, chairman yes I'm please i'm from indonesia i'm interested to understand more about the power of study uh, 
if, uh, for example, if we conduct a longitudinal study, and uh, for the first step, for, for baseline data, we use, uh, for example, 80% of power. And then on the follow-up study, then the number of uh, sample going to decrease. Can we say that the power of study is decreased at this time or we should adjust uh, the power of study? Thank you. If I've understood your question correctly, you want to know whether we can change the power of study. Is that right? In exactly. some yeah, especially in longitudinal study. Yes, uh, but the change has to be done before starting the research. Midway, after compiling your cohort, you cannot change your mind and say, okay, I have got more money, I have got resources, so let me improve the power of the study. That is not advisable. You, you have to predetermine the power at the start of the study. And you can increase it. If your previous study was 80%, you want to be more confident, you want to do a more accurate research, yes, of course, you can increase your power. There is no restriction on that. But not midway through the study, only before you start the study. Okay, so what if, uh, the, what if the number of sample being decreased uh, uh, for uh, some, some reason, the number of sample at the follow-up study yeah, are yeah. getting decreased? And can we say that the power of study uh, decreased too? Yes, exactly. Suppose you calculated that you need to have a cohort of 200 people. And initially you compiled 200 people, but there was a, it's a longitudinal study. People dropped out. People got removed from the study. Either they died, they moved, or they just simply withdraw. And at the end, you are left with a data on only 150 people. So that 200 sample size was with a power of 80%. But now if the sample size is left to 150, then you are not able to meet the power of 80%, it has reduced. So the study will not remain as valid as it was earlier planned to be. So in order to compensate for that, we say that if you are expecting any kind of it, attrition or dropout of the cases, you should compensate for that at the beginning of the study. That means if you say there are going to be 20% dropout, then you should compile 240 sample instead of 200. Yes. So that even if there is a 20% dropout, at the end of the research, you are left with data on 200 people, which is the minimum requirement. And remember, the sample size we calculate, we say this is the minimum required sample size to meet the type 1 and type 2 error. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, shall we mention it in the, uh, in the method? Yes, yes. You need to mention it, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. In fact, another example of that could be like you are designing a time-bound research like a postgraduate thesis and you suddenly find that COVID came in and Jakarta was hit by a wave of COVID pandemic and you realize that you are left with a smaller sample size. Yeah, then that's I would say it might happen to my research. Sir. <laughs> so you can exactly report that even if you have to close the uh, research at a certain time point, because it was time bound, then you can certainly say that you now have a smaller sample size and the study is powered to uh, uh, assess the difference that you were trying to assess with a power of let's say 70% or 60% at the end. I think that would be uh, reasonable. Uh, the only quick take back from this would be you should know how to calculate sample size using power and sample size software or G power software and be able to calculate sample size based on a difference in two proportions or based on a difference in two means or comparing one particular mean to a predetermined or pre-evaluated or pre-established value. So once you are able to do this, you can do most of the sample size calculations. And I'm sure that Dr. Arun Sharma will be very annoyed when I say that most of sample size calculation is just a game of uh, statistical jugglery and you can bring your sample size down to a smaller number if you can increase the effect size. Although effect size should be clinically determined and clinically estimated based on prior studies, however, still in previous published literature and in different studies, you get a wide range where you do have an option of uh, playing with the effect size 
in such a manner that you can bring down the sample size to more manageable numbers, even in studies where you first might find the sample size was extremely daunting. Sir, your comment on that, Professor Arun Sharma. I know you don't uh, you don't like that approach, and that is a scientific approach. Um, but let's hear you on that. Yeah, in fact, in in practical situations on reality situations, what you say is absolutely right. Even I have to do that at some point of time when uh, the situations are not ideal. Yeah, and and moreover, uh, you have literature where the ranges are so wide that if you pick up a more uh, a different study you might really find that it is possible to bring down the sample size to manageable numbers versus finding another study where you have a very small effect size and then you are juggling with very large sample sizes in your estimates and cutting a sorry figure. That's also true, yeah. So if, if we do not have any further questions on this, we are going to move to how sample size is reported in journal publications. So we have uh, picked out a few articles some of which we will be sharing with you to do as assignments in your groups later. And one of those we will be discussing here and Shailaja would be presenting uh, the article and will present how exactly sample size is usually reported in published literature. So most studies in most journals don't even talk about sample size. And it becomes a redundant exercise most of the time. But in ideal conditions and ideal articles, it is always good to uh, present how you came to a sample size calculation, what were the assumptions used, and what was the power uh, calculations that you did. So we'll pick up a few uh, articles where this kind of reporting has been done. And Dr. Shailaja will present and uh, discuss one of such articles. Dr. Shailaja. Thank you, sir. So as I said, it was really difficult uh, to find the articles where appropriate reporting of sample size has been done. Uh, in fact, to be very precise, only uh, journals of good repute like NEJM or BMC had such articles where uh, sample size was reported appropriately. So I think it will be a good exercise for us to know how to report sample size. Although sample size reporting is a very crucial part in your protocol when you're presenting that to your ethics committee or the scientific committee, it is as important to report the same when you're uh, publishing your literature. Okay, so without further ado, for this particular uh, session, we have chosen a case control study design only because that is what we have been discussing so far. So in continuity, when you're talking about sample size reporting, the first question and the most obvious question is, what do you report when you report a sample size? By which I mean, what are the components that you will be using? Since we've already discussed about G power and uh, power and sample size calculator, the both the softwares. This is the third software that is very readily available. It's called Epi Info, and it is a mobile-based application also. It is a web-based application also. And I think uh, any of you uh, can download it right now also on your phones. It's called Epi Now. I think the current version will be 7. This is what the screen when you open it, uh, when you open the Epi Info, there will be an option for Stat Calc. There will be three options. The to topmost option is Stat Calc, which is basically used for calculating sample sizes. When you navigate to that, you will find various options for various study designs. The language is pr pretty simple. The user interface is also very user-friendly. So I chose the option for unmatched case control study. This is the uh, basically uh, screen that appeared in front of me. And this will tell us what are the things that we have to report. So one by one, we have to report the confidence level or the uh, confidence of what we now know as uh, alpha. So if your alpha is 5%, we know complementary of that would be 95%. We have to report power. Power is complementary to type 2 error, that is beta. So if beta, as sir has already said, is 20%, then your power naturally becomes 80%. 5% and 80% uh, values for alpha and beta, alpha and power of the study respectively are not sacrosanct, but they are the most commonly used values. So you can adjust this. Basically, you can use this cursor and adjust for the values. Uh, similarly, in the drop-down menu, you can choose different levels of uh, confidence level. After that, you will be using the ratio of controls to, to cases. Amir sir has already discussed 
that usually we take one is to one, one is to two ratio. That is for every case you have two controls. That will be better. Even better would be one is to three, but you will see no additional benefits after one is to four. So you have to report the ratio of the controls to the cases. You have to report the percent of controls exposed. That is, this you will find from your a priori hypothesis or your literature search that what amount of controls were exposed to a certain risk factor that you're studying in your uh, research. This also can be adjusted using this cursor over here. And finally, we have the odds ratio. This also you will find in most of the published literature. So whenever you are doing literature review for your study, you will be finding all of these values. These you will be deciding, the three of these, and the rest you can find in the literature. So once you have put in value for uh, the odds ratio, the person of the cases with exposure will obviously be determined by taking these two into consideration. So these are the components that we have to report. Now to take an example, this is the study that we will be discussing now. There was a study uh, published in BMC, uh, uh, Pregnancy and Childbirth. Uh, the title of the study is Risk Factors for Severe Postpartum Hemorrhage. And the design of the study is a case control study. Please stop me if you need me to uh, uh, rewind or if you need me to uh, say again anything that you have missed. Jumping directly to the methodology part, usually sample size calculation, you can find a different uh, heading altogether also for it. But most of the articles that I went through, they had reported the sample size calculation under the methodology part. I have highlighted the part that we will be concerned with. So we all know that in case control study, we study the cases and the controls for a particular disease or a particular health state. In this, that would be PPH. The risk factors that we are studying are for PPH. Now let's see how they have defined the cases and the controls. So they are saying that the cases and the controls will be those of severe PPH. The cases will be of severe PPH. And the risk factors they are studying are maternal age, that is one, and induction of labor, the second risk factor. So they are calculating sample size for both of these estimates. One by one, they are taking the risk factors and then they are proceeding ahead with the sample size calculation. They have reported that the significance level that they are going to take is 5%. So in our epi info, the confidence level that we will be reporting will be 95. The power that they have taken is 80%. So this is uh, basically the convention that they have taken. The case control ratio they report to be one is to two. Now the next line basically tells us the percent of cases or the percent of controls that have been exposed. Since the risk factor, the first risk factor is maternal age, they have reported that 18% of parturients are 35 years or older. So they are saying that 80% of the controls are already exposed. Exposed to the risk factor, the risk factor being a high age, which is 35 years or more. And then they say from their uh, literature review, they say that a minimum detectable odds ratio that they are going to consider is one is to, uh, four, one is to four or 1.4. And putting all of that into the formula or the software that you're using, they finally got a, a value of 656 cases. And multiplying that by two, you get 1312 controls. So we had a one is to two ratio. So that means a total of 1968 uh, patients they are going to take. Then they proceeded further and they estimated the frequency of induction of labor. That is the second risk factor, which was induction of labor. And the frequency of induction of labor that they have estimated was a mean of the two things that they have considered. The two things being that in Norway or the study setting where they are doing the study, the frequency of labor induced with oxytocin is 3.4%. And the population-based study exam uh, basically reported the total rate of induction of lab labor was 10.8%. Since they did not have a direct measurement, they basically took a mean of these two rates. And that is that will constitute your rate of exposure for the risk factor for the controls. Then they are assuming the odds ratio to be 1.6 and putting all of that into, consider, uh, into the formula or the software they finally got a value of 698 cases and 1396 controls. And then they added the two and they finally got a total of 2094 cases.
I have performed the calculation in the Epi Info software, taken the significance level 95, power to be 80%, ratio of controls to cases to be 2, percent of controls exposed. Here I have considered the risk factor to be age, which was 35 years, which we have studied over here, 18% population they said was exposed. And uh, after putting in the odds ratio to be 1 is to 4, we finally get a sample size of 656 for cases and for controls, 1312. And that is the one that they have reported. And again, to reiterate the fact that Ashish Girl sir has already said many times, softwares like power and uh, sample size calculation, they already give you a ready to write uh, uh, sort of framework, which you can use, which you can copy paste and uh, alter according to your needs and use that for reporting of sample size calculation in your protocols also, as well as in your uh, final paper also. So cool. Uh, thank you, Shailaja, for that uh, quick presentation on how a reporting of sample size is usually done when you are writing a manuscript. Let me bring in Dr. Nidhi. Dr. Nidhi, would you have any comments or uh, thoughts on sample size that you would like to add here? Dr. Nidhi Bhatnagar. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Ashish. Uh, uh, it was a very nice presentation uh, uh, by Dr. Shailja. And she beautifully demonstrated that what what uh, sample size calculations were there in the journal. They, she actually did it in the software. But my query uh, regarding this uh, presentation, uh, Shelja, if we can have that uh, that uh, slide again, uh, which uh, which shows the sample size calculation in the in the article. So uh, if we see here, uh, uh, when they have started describing the sample size uh, estimation, they have said that they are, they are considering maternal age and induction of labor as potential risk factors for severe PPH. And, uh, but probably uh, my, my uh, uh, agenda for discussion here is we can go back to the title, the title, uh, the, the previous slide. Yes. So here the title is the risk factors for severe PPH, a case control study. And if you come down to the fourth slide again, in this risk factors, the, the authors have chosen maternal age and induction of labor. And if you go into the detail of this uh, article, probably uh, when the results come out, uh, maternal age and induction of labor, the, the, the results, they have not actually identified them as potential risk factors for PPH. It has come out with uh, previous history of PPH as one of the major risk factors for uh, um, uh, postpartum hypertension. So my issue is that what factors, the, and these are the basis for entire sample size calculation. So what actually should be taken and the authors have not provided any reference also why they have from which article they have chosen and zeroed, zeroed in on these two factors only. So uh, if we if we want to critically analyze then probably this this can be discussed that why uh, why this and how could they have been could 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 we have looked for other factors. Um, so um, we may we uh, we. I, we may start discussion on this if somebody has a comment on it. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Arun Sharma could uh, address that issue and uh, we could take that. Because, uh, because okay. I, yeah. sir, sir, uh, sir, I would like to add on this because many a times when we are re reviewing articles and even when we are searching for uh, 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 review articles for our own study that what article should we consider for sample size calculation, we often, we often land in this confusion that which, which data we should actually use. So we end up using the data which gives us the sample size which we want to have. So Yeah, very true, very true, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, sir, please. So, let me tell you a few rule of thumb, rules of thumb here. Uh, first thing is, if there are multiple risk factors that are contributing to causation of a disease, and you want to understand the quantitative estimation of each of the risk factor, then we go by the rule that suppose there are five risk factors and they have different prevalences in the unexposed group, and you calculate the sample size using all five different risk factors. In fact, one of the papers which uh, Selja has shared with you, I remember, they have actually done this exercise, that they have calculated use, sample size using all the possible factors. And then the largest sample size that you get 
by default will be covering all the smaller sample sizes calculated. So suppose your minimum sample size calculated with one risk factor is 300 and the highest sample size calculated was 700 and the other sample sizes were between 300 and 700. That means if you choose the parameter which is giving you a sample size of 700, by default you have covered 300, 400 and 500 also. So we advise that the, uh, the risk factor which is the smallest odds ratio or which has the least prevalence will give you the maximum sample size. So you go by that and choose that. Or the other answer is if there is a technical difficulty in assessing all the risk factors or the clinical significance of all risk factors are not equal, then you have to justify that you are using a particular risk factor which you consider as most important, even if it is not giving you the largest sample size. Then that has to be related to your setting of objectives of the research. If your primary objective of the research is to find out the relationship between a risk factor and the disease, a particular risk factor in question, irrespective of other risk factors, then you will go for the sample size for that and others will remain, uh, understanding other risk factors become your secondary objective. That is the other way out. But ideal is to go with the largest sample size. And the convenience of choosing that particular uh, article, uh, which is giving you your desired sample size, is obviously a sample of convenience or referring to a convenient method of calculating, which is certainly not statistically or scientifically correct. In that, the dictum is choose a study which is geographically nearest to your area of research. If you're doing this research in Delhi, then you're the other study which you want to quote should be, uh, should have been done in Delhi. If not Delhi, in a similar population, say a metropolitan city in North India. If not that, then probably go for the whole of India. If not that, then go for South Asia like that. Those compromises are allowed depending on availability of research, but not by the convenience of matching your uh, available sample size. That's it, that's all. Yeah, yeah, thank you, sir. So I, you, sir. I think that emphasizes uh, that concept enough that you generally choose the highest sample size, the risk factor which gives you the highest sample size that all the others are covered. So may I ask a question if none of the participants are yet ready to ask the question? Please go ahead. Uh, so what are, the, what are the harms, if any, with taking a larger sample size than calculated? And I'm talking statistically, not in the terms yeah. of logistics that we will require more, more logistics. No, statistically, there is no harm as such, but when you calculated your sample size, you fix certain criteria that type one error will be 5%, type two error will be 20% like that. Yeah. Now, suppose you exceed the sample size by double. If the calculated sample size is 60 and you, you recruit 120 participants in the study. Now, this 120 participants will actually give you an erroneous p-value yes. because you might be aware or all the participants I want to say that one of the disadvantage of a large sample size is that uh, if you go deeper into statistics, you will find that you can prove any difference to be statistically significant by increasing your sample size infinitely. Let me illustrate this point that the, the example in which Ashish was talking about uh, reading habit and blue color, a choice of blue color, he showed the difference between the two groups having a, uh, an odds ratio of 5.9. Now, for that, we calculated a definite sample size, say for example, 70. Now, if you increase the sample size to 300, then, and after that, if you apply the test of significance, you'll find your p-value coming out to be 0. 0.00001. Okay, that means it is showing as extremely significant. Or with that uh, sample size, even an odds ratio of 1.01 may become statistically significant. So you are going to make a inappropriate or wrong either overestimation or you are going to make an underestimation of the true relationship or the true odds ratio that is existing in the in that particular group. 
So this is the disadvantage of having a larger sample size without altering your alpha and beta parameters. You need to redefine your alpha and beta parameters if you increase the sample size, and that you cannot do up going back. Once a study has been done, then you cannot go back and say that I wanted to have a different alpha and different beta. That is the problem statistically with a larger sample size. Sir, can I ask one question, sir, Doctor Nidhi, yes. sir? Yes, sir, sir, in your lecture, you mentioned that uh, if we are not randomly selected our sample, then tests of significance don't hold any relevance in inferential statistical analysis. Yeah, yeah. So, sir, my query is that if we, in the in the exploratory analysis part, if we find the data to be normally distributed, hmm. uh, because of the uh, the size of the sample, if the sample is la large and we have a normal distribution of our data. then yeah. also we cannot go ahead with uh, a test of significance because usually then we we uh, like we go ahead usually the practice is that people they they report a test of significance in if if the normalization criteria holds true then yes there is a there is a theorem uh, i shall just please remind me i once again forgot the name the, so the central limit theorem central limit theorem thank you Central limit theorem gives us this leeway in statistics that if your sample size is too large, or in the population, if you take sample from an infinitely large population and you repeatedly take these samples, then the sample mean will always have a normal distribution. So, if the sample mean has a normal distribution, we assume that the population will mean will also be normally distributed. This is called central limit theorem. so central limit theorem gives us a weapon uh, in our hands where we can justify even a non normally distributed sample also but it is something like a last resort we should not always fall back upon this central limit theorem pre uh, premise and consider any and every sample to be normally distributed that will not be probably a statistically fair and honest thing to do so i have a question for you yes please let me Uh, so like sometimes when we are doing and planning the research thesis for a pg student yeah uh, that time we go for sample size analysis uh, calculation and we get a sample say of only 10 patients per group with yeah. power of study as 80% and uh, alpha error as uh, 5% yes and then we talk to the statistician that since we'll have more availability of time and resources and uh, can we increase the power to 90% so yeah. when we increase the sample size generally comes to 1.5 times the calculated as yeah. per the 80% power mm -hmm. so it will come up to 30 that means 15 per group Right. so is it okay uh, to commit this in the beginning and uh, then proceed yes there is one more angle to it which you have to understand that if you are using a quantitative variable that means a measurable quantity uh, after collecting the data you would like to see whether it is normally distributed or not and the normal distribution actually follows two distribution patterns one is what we call a t distribution and the other normal distribution is z distribution okay usually we see that if the sample size it's it's just an it's just an observation this is again not something very statistically sacrosanct that if you have a sample size less than 30 then it is very difficult to define the normalcy i mean you cannot comment uh, whether the sample is normally distributed or not if your total sample size is 30 it is something like when you are doing a laboratory investigation you, you require a certain amount of blood or urine or any sample to run that test and if the sample size is smaller say you have you need 5 ml of urine and you run the sample on 2 ml of urine it's an insufficient quantity so in that insufficient quantity it will give you a value but you cannot rely on that value as a, as a as a true representative value of that person's uh, parameter so you have to discard it saying quantity not sufficient so here also if your sample size is less than 30 suppose is 20 or 18 or 12 or 6 then we have to accept that it is not good enough to decide whether it is a normally distributed sample or not and if that is so then how can you apply a test which is applied only on normally distributed data 
That is, if you are doing a t-test or if you are doing an ANOVA or if you are doing a linear regression, then probably we cannot do that unless we are sure that this is normally distributed. So that is one thing. Secondly, if the sample size you have is 10 with 80% power and you believe that if you increase the power to 90%, you can get 30, which will satisfy the normalcy uh, analysis criteria as well as increase, increase the power of your study because 90% is definitely better than 80%. So yes, there is no problem in that. You can always go ahead and increase that sample size. But uh, the, actually the narrative which is written in the, uh, in the protocol is, uh, is a little flawed, which I've seen in my past experience in sitting in these protocol presentations, that the calculated sample size was 10, but since we had time and we had resources, so we are going for more, that is not the correct uh, reasoning. The reasoning should be, you forget about that. You said that we decided to conduct the study with 90% power and 1% type one error. Nobody is stopping you from doing that. As 5% is your big starting point, so you improve it, you make it to 1%, 80% power is your starting point. You want to increase it to 90%, absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong in it. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, continuing with that, I would like to ask you something else, sir. So like for pilot studies, we most of the time say that uh, 30 can be taken as sample size per group. So I think the basis is that only that 30 would be the representative of a population and uh, normal normalcy of data can be checked on that 30 exactly. number. Exactly, yes. In fact, uh, if uh, I had known earlier, I have a few slides where we have shown that as you increase the sample size from five to 10 to 20 to 30 to 50, how the curve changes. And after 30, it becomes almost constant if the data is normally distributed. So we take 30 mm -hmm. as the uh, at the cutoff limit. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Um, thank you very much for this um, participation. And I hope uh, uh, what I said did make some sense and you, you are better informed now about the sample size calculation. And I hand over to Shelja for concluding this session. Thank you so much, sir, for that comprehensive, brilliant and very intriguing lecture. Always a pleasure listening to you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Good day, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.